Mammals have been the rulers of the Earth for the last 66 million years. Before us were the giants we call the dinosaurs, who ruled over our ancestors with such dominance that they were stuck living in the shadows. With no chance to compete, something drastic had to change for the mammals to rise, and that finally happened when the dinosaurs were suddenly wiped off the Earth. 66 million years later, mammals have thrived and diversified into many different niches and lifestyles. Yet even now, the thought of the dinosaurs ever coming back strikes fear into our hearts. But us mammals are no longer those small animals living in the dustbin of history. So what would happen if we were sent back to Cretaceous? What mammals, if any, could survive alongside the dinosaurs? The first mammal we'll be examining is the Smilodon, or as it's more famously called, the saber-toothed tiger. The saber-toothed tiger was one of the most powerful felines of all time, and when they roamed the earth, they were one of the most formidable predators in their environment. So formidable, in fact, that they could take down even the largest of prey, such as the bison, giant sloths, and and even young mammoths and mastodons. But this cat was built for it, as they had some specific adaptations that made the megafauna their main targets. For one, their front legs were extremely strong and well adapted to grapple their prey to the ground. And once on the ground, they would deploy their giant saber teeth as a killing blow, stabbing into the neck of the animal, where they would certainly die of blood loss. Though this technique was pretty risky and could easily lead to teeth breaking or bones shattering. Luckily for the cat, at least, the saber toothed tigers likely hunted in packs. We think this because many of their bones show signs of healing, which is near impossible to do for a solitary animal. These packs made the lethality of such a predator even more dangerous. But how would they do if they are placed into the Cretaceous? Well, firstly, by far the largest pressure that the saber-toothed tiger would face is its competition with other predatory animals. While Smilodon typically was at the top of the food chain in its own ecosystem, if placed into the Cretaceous, it would immediately be ranked as one of the smaller predators in its respective environment. And in this new position, they would have to contend with some much different circumstances. For one, they would have to face the reality of defending kills from the larger theropods, which would be extremely difficult. Because let's say they are placed in the environment with a T-Rex, who many believe was a giant scavenger. Defending their prey would be near impossible against such large beasts. Not to mention, they themselves could also become part of the menu, and adding to this pressure, the whole time they would have to compete with other medium-sized theropods, who also would have been too small to hunt the largest herbivores. The competition during the Cretaceous would have been immense. Luckily though, the saber-toothed cat does have some traits that would be really beneficial no matter the time period. To start with, the Smilodon was no stranger to hunting prey larger than itself. Because as I said before, its power, pack structure, and dagger-like teeth were crafted to go after the megafauna of the Ice Age. So while there's no way it could hunt the largest prey, it could definitely go after smaller and growing ceratopsians and hadrosaurs. Combined with this, they would likely be much faster than the dinosaurs, reaching bursts of speeds up to 30 miles per hour, which not only could help them catch prey, but also would allow them to escape from being the prey. Or if for some reason they had trouble with hunting, they could always look out for dinosaur eggs. That would surely be an excellent source of nutrition, and not too uncommon. When looking at all these factors, I will be placing the Smilodon as beats here in the Cretaceous. High competition and their small size is what stops them from being placed any higher. But it is highly probable that if placed in the correct environment, that the cat who is adapted to take out the largest mammals could translate this power into the Cretaceous. Our second contender is the tallest land mammal to have ever existed, the Paraceratherium. This animal's adaptations share many similarities with the sauropods that predated it. It was kind of like a mix between an elephant and a giraffe, but it's actually a relative of the modern day rhino. Anyways, it stood at about 16 feet tall at the shoulders, was about 24 feet long, and weighed anywhere from 15 to 20 tons. This animal was massive, and it is believed to have probably been the largest size a mammal could theoretically grow. This giant size had some benefits, but also some downsides. Nevertheless, let's focus on the advantages first. One benefit of its size is that it basically had no predators, and kind of acted like a blue whale. So big, no one really messes with it, and this adaptation kept them safe from almost all predation during its span on Earth. The size also came with the added benefit of reaching to the tops of trees, which would unlock valuable sources of food that weren't available to other animals. But this brings us to our first drawback. One being how the Paraceratherium would have to have spent most of its life grazing on plants, as its immense size required enormous amounts of food to sustain itself, so any drops in the food supply would have had some serious effects on their survival. But this wouldn't be their only drawback. With the Paraceratherium being a mammal, its gestation period would have been extremely long. The larger the mammal is, tends to correlate with the time it takes to have a baby. For example, it takes 9 months for a human, an elephant close to 2 years. And with the Paraceratherium's size being about 3 times 
time is that of an African bush elephant, its own gestation period was likely much longer. But this strategy did pay off as it walked the earth for nearly 10 million years. But how well did this strategy do in the time of the dinosaurs? Well, quite frankly, the Paraceratherium basically just copied the adaptations of the sauropods, except made it worse in almost every way possible. While they were large by modern standards, when compared to the sauropods, it was pretty small. And even when comparing that against just the predators of the era, they weren't that large, so this immense size wouldn't have been that beneficial anymore. Combined with the fact that they really didn't have any defensive traits like horns, frills, or any other defensive feature really, the Paraceratherium would basically be a sitting duck for the largest dinosaurs especially when taking into consideration that these animals were thought to have lived solitary lives, making it even harder for them to defend themselves. But even still, its size could theoretically ward off the biggest theropods by intimidation, or possibly by using their giant legs to kick them. The only problem is, maybe it's possible that they could defend themselves. The question as to whether the Paraceratherium could defend themselves while also defending their young is an easy one to answer. It would be next to impossible, or at least extremely challenging. And each and every time they lost their calves, they would be set back years years of progress. Compare this to the sauropods, who are estimated to have laid upwards of 400 eggs a year. Sure, less of them would reach maturity because they would be more vulnerable, but the quantity in this situation would be a lot more important than the quality, as a higher amount of young would give them higher odds of at least some reaching adulthood. So even if the grown adults could defend themselves, there's just no way they could defend their young too, which over time would lead to their species' inevitable demise. Sorry, but when it comes to size, there's just no way they could outcompete the sauropods or the plenty of other large dinosaurs, while also being able to survive in a world with predators adapted to hunt those very giants. And that is why I will be ranking the Paraceratherium as F for food. There's just no way they could survive. Moving on to our next mammal, and this one is the ancient mammal you have all been waiting for. But before I tell you guys, from the bottom of my heart, I'd really appreciate it if you guys subscribed so my life doesn't look like dish. Coming to bed, honey? Anyways, the next mammal is the woolly mammoth, one of the most famous mammalian megafauna to ever exist. The woolly mammoth was an elephant well adapted to survive in the harsh conditions of the tundra, and these adaptations include their large size. Standing at about 11 feet tall and weighing anywhere from 6 to 8 tons, this immense size did great work in insulating their body from the cold. Combined with this, they also had thick fur that covered their body, giving them even greater protection. But the cold wasn't the only thing they needed to be protected from, as their time on Earth saw some of the largest mammalian predators of all time. So being protected from these adversaries was extremely important, and when protection came, the mammoth was no rookie. Combined with their size, they also had a set of tusks that could be used as a very powerful weapon when fighting off predators. Additionally, their trunks were used as excellent defensive weaponry. Lastly, and most importantly, there are any well, at least until us humans found out about them. But how well would they do alongside the dinosaurs? Well, firstly, even while their tusks and trunks aren't the best weapons, it's still better than nothing, and combined with their formidable size and packed structure, they would do a decent enough job at protecting themselves and their young, even against predators that were the same size as them. Though it probably wouldn't be too hard for a large theropod to hunt a lone mammoth, once again, a pack of coordinated mammoths would be very challenging. Nevertheless, they would also have the same problems like the Paraceratherium, because every time a calf wandered away and got eaten, they would be very hard and tiny time consuming to replace, which would be one of their biggest problems. But another problem would be the conditions of the Cretaceous. Firstly, it was much warmer than the temperature the mammoth was adapted for. Its size and fur would likely lead to heat exhaustion pretty quickly if it wasn't in the coldest parts of the world. But there's another part to this. While mammoths were pretty versatile in their food consumption, they preferred grass the most, which wasn't yet as widespread on Earth as it is today. So being able to find foods would be a grueling task. Lastly, being able to establish themselves in a niche dominated by other large herbivores could be a pretty daunting task, especially when those herbivores were better adapted to not only live in the Cretaceous, but also to live alongside the predators in it. Overall, with the mammoth's large size, decent defenses, and most of all, their high intelligence, they would be a pretty tough nut to crack, even in the Cretaceous, though they would have a few hurdles to overcome, their extremely low replacement rate, as well as being able to adapt to the new conditions of the Earth. And because of this, I am going to have to place the mammoth at C. If they're able to defend their young, I'll place them higher, but I do believe that this would be a pretty challenging task. But why don't you guys tell me what you think about that ranking? Do you agree, or is there something that I'm overlooking? I tried taking the feedback from this video, but maybe I missed something. Anyways, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, I'll see you next week 
and Jehona out.